Um, this is the uh, CS185C, CS286, the course in mobile programming. Uh, let me show you how to find the, the course page. Um, so you go to my uh, web page. Well, how do you know where my web page is? Let me show you that part. Um, you go to a pretend, potentially familiar site. You type in my name. Actually, you don't even have to type in my whole name. And the very first link is my web page. So go to, then it, there's an SJSU page that only has two functions, namely to show my office hours here and to show, to get to the course page, which is here. And that's the page that we'll be living on for this semester. So today I want to just go over the basics, make sure that everyone knows what's going to be happening at the course, uh, discuss how to, how to add people who want to add uh, and <coughs> it will start in earnest on Tuesday. So, first of all, <coughs> you know, what, what are we trying to do? It's a course on mobile programming, um, and we want to learn how to program on mobile platforms, like you know, this, this guy here. And so, <coughs> there's you know, a whole bunch of stuff, obviously, that one needs to know, APIs, you know, what, uh, uh, architectural considerations, and so on. And uh, one goal is also to learn good software engineering habits as we go along so that hopefully when you have job interviews you can talk about what it is that you built in this course and uh, why it means they should hire you. So why mobile? <coughs> well, everyone knows why mobile because nobody uses a desktop anymore. Have you even seen a desktop in the last five years? I mean, uh, <coughs> people, no, people do, but it's, uh, nowhere near as much as it, as it used to be. Um, and who needs a laptop these days? Um, about a year ago, I uh, was the proud owner of an iPad for about a day when my wife discovered it, and now it's hers. And ever since, she has not opened her computer. She, I said, this is crazy. You type out your emails on that silly little on-screen keyboard. I bought her an external keyboard. She's not using the external keyboard. So, <coughs> I, and so for her, an, an iPad is more computing power than, <coughs> than she needs and a, and a more con convenient form factor than what a laptop would do. Um, so 99% of the population are not like you and me. And a few years out from now, it, you're gonna find it more difficult to get one of these guys. You still want one because uh, as content creators, you know, we need things with a keyboard and, and stuff and with a lot of uh, <coughs> fast local storage. But uh, who knows, maybe in a few years, we too will uh, somehow find a keyboard and attach it to one of these and have all of our computing power with us. We will still need that big old external monitor. Um, so the world is changing as we speak and the mobile form factor is clearly winning up. And I can't over <coughs> overemphasize how big a change that is. So ever so often, there are these phases where computing technology changes uh, under us, and those changes are really substantial, and they uh, <coughs> mean that uh, old companies you know, will wither and die, uh, new opportunities come up. And so if we just look at you know, the phases of hardware here, there's <coughs> you know, mainframes at first, so here you have a photo of what computers used to look like when I was a student. And um, <coughs> I was at the tail end of when everything that was done was done on a mainframe. My, my first programming class, I had to put in jobs into a mainframe, and it was painful. So when mini computers came out at the time, you couldn't get a thing that looked, you know, maybe the size of that podium back there, and it had a genuine computer in there. And the lab that I worked in, you know, we killed for one of those things and made sure that we, <coughs> that we had one as soon as we had a budget for it. It was maybe $50,000. Um, <coughs> it had the computing power of your average toaster oven today. And <coughs> but still, at the time, it was a big revolution. Then you could get these workstations, you know, same things that looked like a, uh, a desktop with a large monitor, um, engineering workstations. They cost maybe $20,000. And you had all of that computing power right on your desktop. It was, it was magical. And <coughs> so companies that made those mini computers didn't look so good anymore. You may remember, or more likely not remember, 
Digital Equipment Corporation, the guys who made that big box that, that we bought in the lab for $50,000. 20 years later, they were bought by, by Compaq for a, a very small amount of money, and now they are no more. You know, you may ask, who is Compaq? Compaq was at one point the biggest manufacturer of desktop computers, was then bought by Hewlett Packard, and now is no more. And so it's, it's uh, quite likely that in not that long a time, the people who are today making, or the companies that are today making personal computers and that are making the software for it, that they're going to be falling on hard times. Um, in an office, it's still conceivable that people will want PCs, but will they still want to run Windows? It's not at all clear. Um, my wife apparently hasn't missed Windows. Millions of people who use their mobile phone as essentially their only computer, uh, computing device haven't really missed it. And s most people in, in an office do use such a small percentage of it that uh, it's, it's replaceable. So in, in, <coughs> in 10 years, what we know about computers today and how we interact with them made us be totally, totally different. And we, we don't quite know uh, where because we're right in the middle of this. Again, I remember when personal computers first came up. Uh, it was an exciting time. I bought a... Uh, a personal computer. In fact, it was a compact portable. It had the size of a large sewing machine and had a leather handle. It weighed 30 pounds, cost $3,000, had the computing power of your average toaster oven today. But it was wonderful. It was liberating. I, uh, and at the time, everyone was doing that, and new companies were born that, that worked around that, that shift in, in the computing environment. This is exactly what we're seeing right now. So we're seeing that everyone moves their computations <coughs> and, and the applications to these mobile platforms, and you want to know how to do it. Uh, I want to know how to do it because there's a lot of stuff that I do, and I wanted to run it tomorrow's hardware. So, <coughs> um, so we see this disruption, uh, and we're, we're right in the middle of it. Um, and so this is something that's been studied by, by the business people at Great Link. So there's this book that I recommend. It's an easy read. You can know, check it out from the libraries. Uh, <coughs> It's like all business books. It's, um, there is a great 15-page book sitting in there. And so I'll give you the, <coughs> uh, the basic survey. So what the guy says is he studies what happens when new technologies come up and replace the existing ones. And, so <coughs> um, and how risky it is for, uh, for people who sell the existing technologies. Um, so, and so particularly when you uh, think about right now, where, where Microsoft is at. And I don't want to pick on Microsoft, and they're, uh, but they are in the situation where new technology appears that's cheaper, but clearly inferior. You can't do on an iPad what you can do on a Windows laptop. And what can, what can Microsoft do? Could they produce an operating system that they license to manufacturers of these inferior devices and sell it for less than what those vendors could get elsewhere. Well, that's not actually working, right? Because that would be less than zero dollars. Anyone can get Android for free. And so they're kind of stuck there. And so the bad thing for them is that new technology will improve, and it probably is going to get good enough for most use cases. Like I said, 99% of the users probably don't need it. <coughs> what uh, the current vendors do, and it's worth thinking about that when you send out your job application, they will retreat to that part of the market where the technology is indispensable. They will raise prices like crazy in that market. But eventually, it's going to be an un a niche business. I mean, they, they'll be around for a long time, but it will be a niche uh, business. And so that's why Microsoft is right now really working on getting a new mobile platform up, because they are, of course, reading those business books much more than you and I do. And so they're, they're really worried about this. And so when, <coughs> when you think about what you want to do in the next few years, which kind of companies you want to work for, you know, it's something to think about how quickly these things can change and how difficult these, these transitions, these, uh, <coughs> these disruptive transitions are for, for a lot of companies. Um, you've seen that you know, with Facebook got themselves in trouble because people said they're not really doing enough on mobile. And lots and lots of companies are in this situation where right now they're really grappling with how do we make use of this new technology? That's <coughs> so um, what we'll cover is um, mostly Android programming because I'm assuming most people know Java and it's easy to get into. 
Um, but we'll, we'll want to do a little bit about uh, iOS. Can I just have a show of hands? Who of you has access to a Mac? Meaning that they could bring one for, for a couple of weeks. Okay, that's about half the class. Okay, so I'll have to figure out how we can get, get ourselves some more Macs. Or we might have to set up the lab so that, that the Mac and the non-Mac people somehow <coughs> need a share. Um, I mean, iOS is, is, of course, an important platform, and you want to get a feel for what it's like to program it in it, even if you're going to do, do most of your work with Android. And unfortunately, iOS tools only work on Macs. So <coughs> uh, an important part of application design these days is, yes, we have the mobile device, but where's the data? The data is, of course, not in the mobile device. The data is somewhere in the cloud. And so we want to uh, learn how to architect applications that communicate with, uh, with servers over the internet. We want to <coughs> uh, talk a bit about tablets and what they will bring to, to the table. Um, and so I'm particularly interested as a content creator on how one can use tablets for content creation and how one can take advantage of, of touch and pen and, and that kind of stuff. And so we'll, uh, we'll <coughs> uh, have a bunch of uh, uh, discussions about that. And we'll talk about HTML5. Um, as uh, you know, what you can do your mobile programming uh, where you learn the mobile API, but then you have to do it for multiple devices, and that's kind of a pain. And for many applications, using HTML5 is, it makes it possible to, to roll out your, your app, uh, a single app, on many of these devices. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I've had several vendors who were very interested in talking to you um, because they, for, for various reasons, um, generally to uh, push their uh, special purpose platforms. Um, the Microsoft people would love to have the entire course done with their stuff and they're willing to teach it and uh, give out free devices and stuff. And so we'll certainly take them up on it and see what we can get. Um, similarly, BlackBerry, um, except uh, they don't want to give any free devices, so I, I may <laughs> just ignore them. Um, there's a fellow from Samsung who wants to talk about some Samsung stuff, and so I, I said the, that, that pen, that sounds like something that would be interesting. And so we'll, we'll uh, try to get someone from there. Maybe we'll make, get, get to have a field trip somewhere as well. So we'll see how, how we can get a few people in there. If you have any contact in the industry who wants to give a presentation, then that would be great. I also have a patent attorney who I, uh, <coughs> I'm inviting for a presentation. Um, and you'll, you'll know uh, when we get to there why you want to know a little bit about patents in this space. So once in a while, there, there will be some business uh, legal topic uh, to uh, <coughs> change the pace from what usually is hardcore programming. There'll be projects, um, group projects, as much as possible, four people per, per group. Four is like a good number. Um, one is not a good number, so it really will be group projects. Um, we're always told by the industrial advisory committee that the students, they don't have enough project experience, and the, there's only two ways to get project experience. One is through internships, and the other is through projects and class. And so this is obviously something where one can <coughs> do useful projects. So the theme for the projects, what I'd like to be able uh, to do is push forward the uh, <coughs> mobile client for the CineQuest Film Festival. It's a local film festival here in downtown San Jose. Uh, it plays like every uh, end of February, beginning of March. And a few years ago, uh, when I was teaching a software engineering class, we built them their first mobile client on the BlackBerry. Uh, now when you look at it, it looks kind of funky. Um, and the, that version of the BlackBerry is really pretty dead. Then a couple of, uh, Three years ago, I think three years ago, then Dr. Pollock built them their first iPhone client. And <coughs> um, then we ported the, the BlackBerry thing over to the Android user interface. And it definitely is in need of improvement for, for the future. So there's have several projects, uh, improvement projects for that. that. They're also interested in a tablet client. They would like to know how good one can do HTML5 versus native. Um, so uh, Dr. Pollock started. Uh, investigating some HTML5 stuff, and so I'd like to have one or two project groups push that forward. Now, if someone is, is really interested in, say, working with the Microsoft people and they have a, uh, an interesting project, the obvious project would, of course, be to do a CineQuest client on that platform. If someone is really interested in doing something with a pin, for example, if the Samsung people come through and give us some, uh, uh, some free uh, uh, tools and, and devices, 
then you know, I'd, be, I'd be interested in entertaining that. So if you have any idea, or for that matter, if you have any other idea that you think is going to change the world, then go ahead and propose it, and I'll see if we can accommodate it. But so by, kind of by default, I'd like to stick to, to one theme, so that when we discuss issues about it, it's that everyone is interested in it. <coughs> so um, graduate students, about half of you are uh, graduate students. Um, you need to register for CS286. Um, you cannot get elective credit for 185C. So be sure to register for 286. And that will actually give you option credit in the specialty area, um, which someone should remind me. I need to put into the green sheet so that you can print out that green sheet. And if a year down the road you need to prove that this wasn't the specialty area, you have it. Um, in addition to everything else, uh, as a graduate student, I will, give, is I will assign you a, a topic on which you will do uh, research, um, write a paper, and give a short presentation in class. Um, about 10 pages for the paper and about a tw uh, 15, 20 minute presentation. <coughs> um, and so that'll be necessary for, for you to, to get that credit as graduate students. Otherwise, you do exactly the same thing. Um, <coughs> active learning, so uh, I'm gonna be talking t more today than I'll ever talk again in class. Um, the, the idea is that uh, you do, you read the textbook before class, uh, that we'll do exercises and, and lab work during class. I'll give brief presentations about issues. Uh, we, we can talk about uh, the things that, that are needed for projects, for the homeworks, and so on. But uh, you need to bring in your laptop for every class meeting. I see most of you have a laptop today already. That's, that's great. But we'll start with the lab next, uh, next Tuesday. Um, <coughs> there'll be lots of homework, um, so make sure that you uh, set aside the time for that. And so, of course, as, as you know, if, since, since you've gotten this from computer science, you don't learn a thing from listening to me. You only learn by doing something yourself. And I mean, when's the last time that you sat in a lecture and you said, gosh, that was really insightful. I wouldn't have been able to read that myself. Um, <coughs> and so, so my job really is to guide you along so that you do, uh, to get you to, to learn the stuff. Um, the other way you learn, of course, is by learning from each other, um, and uh, as you'll see when you do the project. Yeah, one thing that I do need to say is that um, you need to do it yourself, and so I need to give my, my plagiarism uh, things so I can later say that I've said it. Um, and so the reason that, that I am going to spend three minutes on plagiarism is that I just came out teaching a 46A class, and at, at the end of the f first non-trivial homework, where you know, it was more than just printing how it worked, I ran Moss, which is a plagiarism checker, and I wasn't happy. Moss told me, it was very clear that about 10% of the students copied from each other, and maybe another 10%, it was kind of iffy. And then I did something cruel. I published the Moss run on the internet so that everyone could see who was copying from each other. I don't want to have to do that. Um, so uh, I will, of course, run Moss, and I will hope that I don't find anything. And so then what happens is, then I have people in my office, and they say, oh, I didn't know. Even though I gave them the same story that I'm about to tell you now. So <coughs> the issue is always with coding is you know, you have s some other code that you get from s someone else, from a friend or from uh, <coughs> from the internet or something. And is it okay to copy it? Yes. But what's not okay? To paste it. <laughs> Control C is fine. <laughs> Control V is the problem. <laughs> so it's the pasting that is the problem. But it is okay to paste if it comes, you know, if you have code that you found somewhere on the internet and it solves a particular problem, it's, it's perfectly fine for this course, you know, as long as that, that code was not someone's proprietary code. But more oftentimes you might find something set in a blog or something. Go ahead and paste it and modify it to your heart's content, but you must give attribution. That means you must say, I copied this from this source. So that 
if I need to evaluate what your original contribution was, then I can go back and say, oh yeah, so that, that code, it was a good idea of that person to find it there, that that was, but that way I would give you credit for that good idea and not uh, for actually creating that code. Or you might have modified the code and I would give you the credit for that, yes? Can we use indentation to make the code that was copied identifiable? I mean, on top of comments, of course. You can, re when, when, if you take code from somewhere and you attribute it and say, this is, this is adapted from whatever, you can then do with the code what you want. So it often happens that there's some blog or a tech note or something that has some code outline that kind of does more or less what you want. And go ahead and take it, attribute it, say this, that you've taken it from there, and then modify it to your heart's content so that it does what you actually want. But it's important that you, uh, that you acknowledge that you've started from something else. Now, in an exam, you know, uh, it would, of course, not be a good idea if you attribute it to your friend who just sent, you, sent it to you by email. So, uh, in an exam, of course, you, you should uh, not copy and paste anything except you know, from, from the materials that, that I give you. Um, <coughs> but what often happens also is we, we're going to be running a, a public discussion forum, and in that discussion forum, you know, you'll find code. Um, and it's perfectly okay to take that code and, uh, and, and modify it. And again, you just want to say that, uh, you just give the URL to where you found it as, as, as the starting point. Or you, you know, if it was the perfect solution for your problem, just use it right away. Which brings up the issue <coughs> whether in the discussion forum, can you put code onto the forum? Or would that be unfair because then other people don't have to discover it themselves? And so I, I ask you to use your good judgment. I mean, you would not want to paste a fully formed solution, but if it's some code that doesn't work, or that has problems, or about which you have questions, bring it on. You can post anything you want. And it, <coughs> particularly if it's, if it's non-working code, you know, you're not gonna give that much away by giving out a bunch of code that doesn't work. Um, and so if in doubt, just just copy and paste your code. And look, usually you want to post some excerpts anyway, not the whole thing, because you usually have questions about something specific. So, and it's fine again to, to learn from that too. Go ahead and read the code that other people do on the discussion group. If you find good ideas in there, it's fine to paste it, just attribute it. What I don't want is that you have some private back channel. And this is what usually happened in this cheating incident, <coughs> that someone emailed something to, a <coughs> to someone else. And what usually happens is someone says, oh, the homework is due in 15 minutes, and uh, can I just have a look at your solution? And so people will then email the solutions, apparently. I don't know why, because what, what happens more often than not is that that desperate re recipient of that email mm -hmm. will simply copy and paste the whole thing in there. Now, at that point, I am a university professor. I am not Sherlock Holmes. Notice the absence of the funny hat. And so what I will simply do, if, if I find that, that two people have identical homework, I will report them both to some student conduct office where they keep you in bamboo cages and cold for a week, and then they ask you who did what. And so that's, that's their job. I simply report it and <coughs> let, let them deal with it. Um, so make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, now I don't think it's gonna happen, but I wanna make sure that <coughs> Uh, you know. So what are you supposed to do? Come to every class meeting. So um, it's not just lecture. Um, I'm recording uh, just in case that, you know, that you're out of town for, uh, for a business trip or something. I am recording every one of these lectures and I'll put them on YouTube. But um, sometimes it doesn't really work. Sometimes the, the audio quality is terrible and whatever. So uh, come to the class meeting because that's where we're going to be doing the lab work and stuff. Um, I. <coughs> I'm going to assign reading before class, and then I'll have uh, some quiz, uh, <coughs> a, a couple of quizzes during class. So every class will pretty much start up with a, with a little quiz, and everyone can see everyone's answers. So you don't want to appear like an idiot and not uh, answer those questions. So make sure you did your reading, particularly in a class where uh, projects are formed that <coughs> you want to have a reputation for knowing what uh, uh, your stuff and not the other way around. Um, so you're expected to spend nine hours per week for this class. There's some formula uh, for that says 4A. 
uh, for a three credit class, you're supposed to spend nine hours. That's two and a half hours in class and six and a half hours outside for preparation, homework, and projects. And I can guarantee you, you, um, you will need to spend those to, uh, to earn your grade. Um, and finally, when you're stuck, and you will be stuck, or I will not have done my job, um, ask questions right away. Uh, so it's very, very important that, that you ask questions. Um, <coughs> homework is due every Monday. Um, there won't be homework uh, this Monday, but starting uh, uh, next week, there will, there will be weekly homework. Um, you submit via version control via Git. I'll give instructions for that uh, soon. Um, homework is due every Monday uh, at 6 p.m., and then you have a grace period of five hours and 59 minutes to submit your homework. So anything that gets there by 11.59 p.m., that's great. And afterwards, <coughs> uh, I will not look at it. So there's no mercy after midnight. Why five hours and 59 minutes? Um, a lot of people's computers break down on Monday night at 6 p.m. I don't know why, but they do. Yes, I've been teaching for many years, and I know this for a fact. Um, in that case, you have enough time to pull out the hard disk, scrape the stuff off there, drive to an internet cafe, and upload your work. Okay. Also, network connectivity is very flaky. At, uh, so it's a dangerous time. So, but in that case, you can drive to Starbucks, and you, know, you, you can do something in those five hours and 59 minutes. Um, <coughs> If I get a, uh, an email that says, oh, I tried to submit it and, and I couldn't be, uh, for whatever reason, and it only got there like at 2 a.m. or at 12.10, I ignore that email. So if you don't get an answer, uh, that's just like, um, I won't break your homework either. So <coughs> uh, take those deadlines seriously. What my strong recommendation is, and you know, you, you know this being seniors and graduate students, is to do the homeworks as if it was due every Sunday at 6 p.m. And then one of two things happens. You might get it done on Sunday at 6 p.m. And then it's beautiful. You have the rest of the Sunday evening free. You don't have any stress on Monday at all. And yeah, that's not a bad situation to be in. Or maybe, despite your best efforts, you didn't get it done on Sunday at 6 p.m. But now look at it. You have an entire 24 hours to solve those remaining problems. So either way, the winning strategy is to completely ignore my deadline and set yourself a deadline that's 24 hours early. All right, so there'll be a lab. The labs will be done in pairs. <coughs> so uh, you will work with a buddy. And I guess it's a, it's a class. Uh, I'll see if I, sometimes I assign the, uh, the buddies. Sometimes I let the students do it. Um, I'll ponder which way I'll do it. And we'll know on Tuesday. Um, <coughs> there are pros and cons for each. And so the general idea is that the reason to work in these labs in a buddy, um, in, in a buddy system is usually these activities are kind of frustrating and something goes wrong. And having two people look at the error messages is pretty effective. And one person usually kn knows uh, what to do even if the other person gets stuck. Or if both people are stuck, sometimes you can, uh, by asking each other questions, you can unstuck yourself. Or of course, uh, otherwise I'll just show up and, and unstick uh, both of you. But it really works pretty well. Um, <coughs> and it works best if you and your uh, lab buddy have about the same level of ability. Um, and so I'll try to have, have lab partners that the way that works. Um, each time one of you uh, types up the, the report, uh, whereas the other one uh, types up the <coughs> the answers, I'm sorry, the types up the code. So there should be one person with a compiler with the IDE and another person with, with just Emacs writing up the answers. And you switch those roles each week. And you submit to the lab works to Git, um, why Git, just to make sure that we, we practice Git and get the bugs out of it. Uh, so Git is a, is a version control system. When we do the projects, um, I want to make sure that everyone has the, uh, knows how to use the version control. <coughs> So, um, you will be stuck a lot, otherwise I'm not doing my job, I'm not leading you to the interesting and difficult stuff. And so if and when you are stuck, it's important that you ask questions. Um, if, if, <coughs> if you're not convinced about uh, this whole thing of being stuck, click on a couple of these links. Um, 
see what this one said. Oh, well, here someone was stuck and had a really dumb question. And actually, when you read through the, the comment, you can see how, how it was dripping with sarcasm that someone would, would ask such a dumb question. And here you can see who it was who now is immemorialized on the internet for asking not very good questions. So I would not be able to function in my professional life without asking questions every day or two. And so you'll, if you Google for me in news groups where I'm, uh, about stuff that, that I know about, you'll see that, you know, I ask questions, people ask uh, a lot of questions, I answer questions, people answer questions that I ask. It's, a <coughs> it's an important part of being a professional. And many students somehow think, gosh, everyone's going to think that I'm so dumb when I ask these questions. And that's, that's true, um, but what are you going to do? You're not going to figure out by yourself in time. So you could either just deal with the fact that other people are going to realize that you don't know the answer to this particular thing, get the answer, and then move on and be smarter t uh, tomorrow. Or you could just stay stupid forever. I mean, those are kind of your two choices. And I've chosen in my own professional life that it's just OK if people know I don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. There's just too, so many things out there. But there's always someone out there who has the answer. And oftentimes, they're perfectly willing to share that knowledge because if everyone answers a bit and asks a bit, it works better for everyone. So there's a whole uh, <coughs> economy of asking and answering questions out there. People will ask and answer questions because it's in their enlightened self-interest to do it. And it's important that one learns how to do it. Um, it's not so easy to ask a good question. And it's easy enough to ask a bad question. I am stuck with my homework. Now what? Right? But how do you then ask a question where you isolate out the parts that might actually be the problem um, in such a way that someone can re glance at it quickly. That takes practice, 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 as so I want you to practice this. So we'll be having a discussion group. We'll be using this Piazza software that, that actually is quite nice um, for online discussions. And anytime that someone asks, uh, sends me an email with a question, I will send a canned answer that says, please put that question on Piazza. And then uh, hopefully when the question ends up on Piazza, then you can answer it before I even get to answer it. That's what happens the last, happened the last two semesters that I was using it. It was great. Then <coughs> people would help each other. People would earn points for asking questions. They would earn points for answering questions. And all I had to do is you know, maybe steer things in the right direction. And so it was, it was great practice for everyone. So we're going to continue doing that. Of course, if you had a private or confidential question, then you write it on a $20 bill and uh, slip it under my office door. No, no, then you just come to my office hours and uh, we'll discuss that. So if there's some, some issue with whatever, some, some, you know what, what it's going to be. So, but otherwise, we're, we're going to be using this discussion group and I promise it'll work great. Textbooks. So, um, the university has this nifty Safari subscription. Um, you need to practice uh, how it works. You can log in from anywhere, but you have to have some, some pin set up. Um, and uh, there's this links on the course page on how to do that. And um, so there'll be a, a reading assignment. So when, I, when we look at the course page uh, real quick here, there is, oops, uh, there's supposed to be one. There will be one later for, uh, no, there is, yeah. The reading assignment is chapter one of PA. Picked out a couple that, that looked reasonable. All right. <coughs> so the reading for, for the 29th is uh, PA is Programming Android, um, chapter one. So you'll, you'll get a reading assignment before each class meeting. There'll be a quick quiz at the beginning of class about the reading, and that's, that's how it goes. Um, prerequisites. Um, you, must, you simply must be competent in Java. So you must be a reasonably accomplished Java programmer. A semester of Java is probably not going to cut it. Um, <coughs> And I, th I think the official prerequisite is 46B, and well, that's, that sounds about right. Um, you must, for the iOS part, where we're using Objective-C, you must know C to some level. And so you should have had a course such as 49C, or maybe you used C in your operating systems class. So you have to know, you know basic uh, C, low-level uh, things. 
that, and not C++. C++ is, we don't need it at all. So you need to know, for example, string copy, every that kind of, and at that level of the API. Um, <coughs> it that doesn't have to be incredibly current. W w most of us are not going to do uh, uh, much with, with uh, iOS, but particularly, of course, if you did want to do that, you'd have to you know, know C or, or Objective-C for that matter. You have to have basic software engineering skills, so you need to know how to, <coughs> uh, uh, you need uh, how to do some kind of build automation. You know, we'll be using Ant for the uh, for the Android part. You need to know uh, uh, the basic concepts of revision control, or you need to be able to learn those very quickly. So, um, like I said, we're going to be using Git, um, not because Git is is more wonderful than Mercurial, but uh, a lot of projects use it, and particularly that CineQuest project uses it. So that that uh, that code is on GitHub, and uh, we'll each team is going to fork it, make their own Git repository. And what's important to me is that you use the version control. Um, because what always happens uh, is that there's one team member, if, if, we, if we don't practice it from the very get-go, there's always one team member who for some reason has trouble with the SSH configuration or something and gets strange error messages from the version control. And then they start emailing code back and forth. And at that point, that team has essentially lost it. They don't know it yet. But their project is so doomed that it's just <laughs> not going to work. And uh, so it is important to, to get the, through, the, through the revision control pane and the setup pane early so that when, when one needs it in earnest that the revision control works automatically. The same thing is true with build automation. Um, <coughs> there is, in, in any team project that involves complex tools, there is the phenomenon known as, but it works on my computer. But it works on my computer is horrible, right? And because in the end, no one gives a care whether it works on your computer. What matters is, does it work on Joe's phone? And so the way to, to deal with that is to make sure that whatever we're building, that it can be rebuilt automatically. So <coughs> um, yes, you're going to build something in, in the IDE and it works on your computer, but you have to be able to run it th through the build automation system so that uh, when you build it and when someone else builds it, it builds the exact same way. In fact, we're going to be setting up some build server that will automatically check out your projects and will, <coughs> and will build them and publish the, uh, the results. Uh, like for, 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 with, with Android, it will publish just the APKs um, on, on a website where one can then download them. And so that thing will just automatically, continuously rebuild your project every five minutes. And <coughs> so, and to, so you, you have to know enough about software engineering to be able to interact with these kinds of systems. You have to be able to use a Linux, Unix-like system and command line tools. And so you'll see when you open up the, that, the programming Android book, they give you extensive instructions as to how to set up the tools on a Linux system. They give you some instructions on how to do it on a Mac, but you can see that the author is wondering why you would do this. And they give you a few perfunctory instructions how to do it on Windows because the editor made them. No one would do, do this uh, <coughs> in this day and age. So um, you don't have to run uh, Linux as, as the uh, main operating system on your laptop. You can perfectly run, run, it, run it inside a virtual machine. But any of these things that, that need to be automatable, that, <coughs> that involve command line, just run it uh, on, on Linux. If you're experienced with a Mac and you can set up the stuff and troubleshoot yourself, then that's great. I mean, all of these things will, of course, work on the Mac. Uh, you just need to be able to, to resolve whatever difficult, uh, diff difficulties and differences there are. Um, but you're on your own. If you <coughs> have a machine that boots up into Windows, the only remedy for you is to install a virtual machine. Um, it's, it's just too hard to get all of this stuff to, to work out. And that's, of course, the, the case these days for just about any kind of <coughs> a, a serious uh, program. So, um, prerequisites. Oh, yeah. uh, prerequisite quiz. So, how do I know that you fulfilled these prerequisites? Because you told me and I believe everything you said. Um, <coughs> no. So what I'm making you do is I'm making you fill out a quick prerequisite quiz um, that you find here. It asks you um, to write a simple Java program. It asks you to write a simple C program. Shouldn't you take you about an hour each? 
it asks you to, to uh, install git and the command line version. Oh yeah, well, there's all, like, all these graphical git clients. Um, do yourself a favor and don't touch them. So uh, if you find something like Tortoise or what, what, what's a graphical git client? Tortoise tree. Okay, so here's another one not to use. And, and so the reason for that is simple, that they hide, <coughs> particularly when you just get, get going with it, they hide the steps behind, and when something goes wrong, what are you going to do? Google the screenshot. When something goes wrong with the command line, it gives you an error message in text that you can pop into Google, and more likely than not, you're going to get a whole bunch of, uh, of answers. And that's something that you know, is, is always amazing to me, how you know, in, in most cases, when I have a program in question and I get some specific error message, I put it into Google and I get an answer. When I have a question with Windows and I put it into Google, I get two million people who share my pain, but, but no answer. But it's different with, uh, with these programming tools. It's amazing how, good <coughs> how easily you can debug them when you use the command line versions. And so that's to make sure that everyone does that. I'm asking you to, uh, to, to run git clone. Give me a screenshot of what happened in your terminal. And finally, I want to make sure that you put your, yourself into Piazza and then you put a picture in there so that we all know what you look like. It's a tiny picture, so it doesn't matter if you don't look pretty. Um, <coughs> well, if you don't put in the prerequisite quiz, I will drop you from the class for lack of prerequisites. Add it. Um, if you want to add, email me the prerequisite quiz and I will send you ad code. This space in the uh, class, so as soon as I get your prerequisite quiz, I will send you an ad code. Use it, use it right away. Um, and prepare your laptop. So, so <coughs> make, in, install VirtualBox. Um, any version of Linux is fine, so if you're partial to a particular one, I'm not going to talk you out of it. If you don't particularly have a favorite, use Lubuntu. It's what I use. I'm familiar with it. And why do I use it? Because it's small and easy, and it doesn't have any, any oddball user interface like some of, uh, like the regular Ubuntu. It looks just like Windows 95, and that's fine with me. Um, <coughs> run it in VirtualBox, or make a dual boot, whichever you prefer. And it really is an easy install. You just download the ISO, and you, you install it. It takes you an hour or so fussing with it if you've never done it before, but there's nothing to it. Uh, install the guest editions, um, and that one is a bit uh, fussy, but uh, the blog that I'm linking to explains how to do it. And install the Oracle JDK, not the Open JDK from Ubuntu, just the regular old Oracle JDK. It explains in the programming Android book how to do that. And <coughs> then, of course, install the tools that, that are mentioned in that chapter one. And then you'll be good with your laptop. So today, log into Piazza, do the prerequisite quiz, read chapter one, install the Android SDK on your laptop, and that's all. Any questions or comments? Yes. I've done some Android programming on my Windows. Do I need to set it up in the virtual box as well? It's up to you. It's, uh, if you are comfortable setting it all up, um, it's easy enough to get Eclipse to work. Um, if you can get Git, the Git command line to work, if you can get uh, the, the Ant build to work, then that's great. What I would do is I would just in case set up VirtualBox. No, I have VirtualBox set up. Should I set up the Android SDK on the virtual. I don't think you necessarily need to do that. All you need to do right, right now is, oh, you know, I think you do need to reinstall it. It's, it's, it's yeah. And install the, the SDK again, install Git on, on that thing, and make sure that from inside the virtual box you can see your external file system. It does set up a, 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 a what, what do they call that thing, a shared folder. And then that way you can do your, your regular development in Windows but all, all of the command line stuff inside the uh, inside virtual box. So that, that would be a reasonable setup. Um, so I think it's, it's really a good idea for everyone to install uh, a virtual box because these th it works because they have everything works fine until it doesn't, and at that point you want to be able to quickly move on. Other questions? Okay, then you know what to do. Send me your prerequisite quizzes, um, and you will be either kept in the class or you'll be given an ad code. And I'll see you on Tuesday with your laptops with the software installed.